He's he is funny. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, last week I was in the hallway with him and he had new shoes and shiny silver things. I said, "Really? You're gonna wear those?" He says, "I have a different pair every show I do." And I just went, "You're such a prima donna," and he just laughs. It's just part of his stick. That's awesome. Hey, want to hear the most annoying sound in the world? Hugo Stiglitz. Heard of everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Meanwhile at the Studio. I'm your host, Nate, joined today by Sean Patterson. Welcome, Sean. Hey, thank you. Good to be here. Yeah. So uh, we're refocusing our shift on the podcast, and we're doing a little bit more uh, insight one-on-one with indie filmmakers uh not just in florida but you know we're, we're going to start local because that's where we are right. so we wanted to bring you in to the show first as our first guest back in this format uh get a little bit of history about the studio itself that we're in and occupying now mm-hmm. of course your dad john patterson started it back in the 1960s and you worked for him for a time so uh I'll let you talk now. So uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> thanks for yeah. coming. Yeah. Yeah. My dad started, uh, I don't know when the actual groundbreaking date, I'd like to find that out, but I think it was either the late fifties or early sixties. Um, he had, of course he started at you know, Florida Cypress Gardens. Right. And then when he wanted to do more stuff at home, cause he was a workaholic, he just loved the industry. Right. So he would, uh, we started at our house. He built a studio in the back. Okay. Sort of like an apartment uh, com, you know, room back there. But he had a screening room, editing room. Uh, sometimes the editors, film editors from like L.A. or New York would come down. They would stay there at the house. Okay. So they had their own like little apartment. And then they would go back there and edit. And, of course, that room got small real quick. I'm sure. I'm sure. I know the machines that uh, we inherited from you guys when we bought the right. place were uh, quite large. And the whole upstairs of our office was dedicated to editing back when Correct. in the day. So, so yeah, there was, I know there was, you know, two guys there and one up, probably one upright and then the screening room. And then of course, you know, worked there for, I don't know how many years, but then built this facility. Nice. So how old were you when uh, he built, when he first built this place? When he... Um, I was probably like, Maybe one. Oh, okay. Wow. So I wasn't even, I don't even think I was born when he started the place. I, I was born in 62. 62. So. Gotcha. So when did you, like, as a kid, realize, like, oh, shit, my dad owns a, a movie studio? Probably when I was one years old. Oh, really? Like <laughs> you I was were... in the first commercial. <laughs> oh, so you were in the first, you were in a commercial? <laughs> yeah. So we, That's cool. I mean, he did so many films. Uh, we do, like, uh, since we're here in Central Florida, and he started at Cypress Gardens, we do a lot of boat shoots, uh, swimwear. You know, Evan Rude Johnson, OMC, Mercury, right. uh, from skis to ski apparel, uh, you know, anything to do with water, fishing. Right. So if there was a little kid, you know, with his dad fishing or, you know, skiing, that was, you know, my dad would had free talent, you know, had. Of course. Yeah, you know, me and my two brothers. So, gotcha. You know, so you so, you started young at one and then just. <laughs> I don't know if it was actually one, but Johnny was definitely, my oldest brother was definitely one. He was uh, in a couple things with uh, Esther Williams. and uh, Oh, cool. I mean, after they did the movie, I think there was a couple promos that you know they did for Cypress Gardens with Esther Williams and a little boy in the swim pool, and that little boy was my brother. Oh, cool. So, but after that, you know, probably like five or six years old. Nice. As soon as I can hold a fishing rod or a. Hold you know, anything, any prop, box right? Or a tent or anything. That's awesome. So for you, it wasn't weird to grow up in this environment that's kind of all you knew yeah that's all we do i mean we dad would have a camera and we'd shoot bring cameras home to do test with high speed film high speed cameras lighting and we'd come down here of course to the studio and we did mini bike commercials or shoots and we would get the mini bikes and we'd ride them around and you right know. so your dad was like the cool dad on career day so- yeah yeah he was yeah yeah that was uh it's a just a nice industry yeah, you get to dabble in a little bit of everything. So right. I, I tell people that a lot because, you know, one day you could be at the Daytona racetrack or the Indy 500. The next day you're in an orange grove learning about citrus, how it's processed. Right. Um, to the, you know, doing a chicken film to, you know, mechanics of making a car to house building to just so many different industries that, you know, we're exposed to. Right. What was the weirdest, uh, the weirdest shoot you guys ever had come through the studios in your in your time here. Well, they're weird, um, or, or you know, off your your non your non you know water based or you know just something off the wall. 
uh, the chicken film was kind of. I talk about that a little bit today. It's like you know, so. To explain the chicken film. What's that about? The chicken film. We did. Uh, my dad would do a lot of commercials for uh, Cooking Good Chicken, okay. which is a big chicken company back in the seventies and eighties. Had a good jingle. Um, the uh, daughter of the company was in a lot of the commercials, but had a good jingle and it was a pretty big uh, chicken uh, rendering plant and you know, chicken place that you know, like Tyson, right. Um, but anyway, we did a lot of commercials for years and then, uh, the son wanted to make a sales video to send out to China and other places to, to show their product. And, and, uh, so we went up there and shot a lot of different things on how the chicken is from when it's born to it goes to the plant, gets cut, you know, and sent down. Yeah. You know, it's, I think it's like a 10 minute process from when it comes in there to it goes to the freezer. It's 10 minutes. That's, so it's pretty quick. That's quick. Yeah. Yeah. So but we walked in there, and they have different things, like the old style, which, you know, they have boys and girls, not boys and girls, but, you know, females and males up there right. just with knives and sectionizing them and quartering them. And then over here was another line, and it was totally automated, you know, machines. Right. But uh, and they're like, you know, show this part. Show us when we, you know, when we cut the heads off. Right. And uh, the investors are going to love it. But the girls and the guys that were cutting it were just like, mostly it was girls. And I just say, you don't want to be married to them and make them mad. No, <laughs> no, just because <laughs> they, had, they had sickles with, you know, the blade on the outside versus the inside. And you're just like, you know, Edward Scissorhand, you know, <laughs> they'll slice you up good. No so, cheating. But it was a interesting, you know, just like a cow, you know, like a beef plant, you know, you just sectionize right. it and all the guts go on the floor and there's rivers. Uh -huh. Like trays of water and all the guts go in there right. and they get shipped to the rendering plant and they get, you know, heated up and dried out and then put back in their own feed. You know a lot more about chickens than you should know. Yeah. <laughs> I still eat chickens though. So yeah. Right, some didn't some people see those films and they're like, I'll never eat chicken again. But. How did it smell? I bet it smelled great. <clears throat> it wasn't too bad because it was really cold. Oh, okay. You know, inside there it was really cold. So it was you know, mostly like 40, 50 degrees, I think. Uh, I so it was pretty cold in there. I think of like a meat processing plant being, you know, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, just, you know, open meats in the air yeah. and just stinking. I mean, once the chicken gets there, it's, you know, that's why it's 10 minutes. It's just real quick line. And by the time it gets to the, the f last freeze or however it works, I can't remember the whole line, but it was pretty quick and cold and didn't smell. The only place it smelled was the rendering plant. I'm sure. I'm sure so that was all not. The, all the guts and everything that they would cook and dry out and then put back in the chicken feed and then you go there and you sweat. And then right. all this like sawdust, but it was chicken dust basically Jeez. that would just get on you after you're sweating, you know, working all right. day with the lights and all that. And you're just like, oh, God, I just want to get back to the hotel and take a shower. I bet. I bet. So, what was your but, first, uh, like the first job you worked at uh, with the studio? First time, like you worked like on a set, not as a, not as a sweet baby talent? Probably Sears, Sears commercials. My dad did a lot of Sears commercials. Mm -hmm. And yeah. what'd you do? Like, what was your film? Like, what was your position? Start as a grip. Yeah. Yeah, you know, just sandbags, apple boxes, stands, reflectors. A lot of time reflectors. Yeah. You just start doing that. And did you get into it because you were like into it, or because it's like your dad has a company and you need to work for him for the summer? Um, it was just to work in the family business. Uh, my brother, mm -hmm. you know, both my brothers were in it as well during high school. Um, my oldest one went to college and was up there schooling. So then my, you know, middle, the middle brother, my next oldest one and me, he was here a lot. So okay. him and I would get in, you know, do a lot of reflectors and, you know, go to you know, Sears commercials, a lot of that. And then uh, my dad did a lot of, um, monster cereal commercials, General Mills right, cereals. Right, right. Count Chocula. Count yeah. Chocula, Lucky Charms, uh, Cheerios. Uh, so we would be a nose. So I was in the Cheerios commercial, and I think it was a Lucky Charms commercial too. Oh, that's cool. But then after we were in it and got older, it was like, you know, hey, grab that sandbag. and. Right, you're not you cute know. anymore, man. Right, yeah, I'm not good looking anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and if you wanted money for gas to go skiing, you know, we needed money. Right, so. So it's like, hey, Dad, you know, Dad wants to pay you 10 bucks or 5 bucks for the day. It's like, hey, that goes to gas to go skiing. Right, that's awesome. I mean, that's a cool job. To, that's a cool summer job. I detailed cars my first job, so I'd rather have been on a set. I think so. I think you got the uh, the good end of that bargain. <laughs> so when did you decide to like turn it into a career? You know, like you were doing it as a hot, or you know, just to make some ski money, just some fun money. But when did you decide, like, oh man, I think I think this is I'm going to take that path instead of you know, like your brother going off to college and. Um. Well, in high school, you know, I wanted to work. You know, come down here. Of course, you know. 
you know, dad would want you to work all day, of course. Right. You know, and I could only work from, you know, one o'clock to five o'clock. So I'd come here and sweep floors, um, work in the carpentry shop, you know, clean out the nail bins, organize mm-hmm. them a little bit, but, um, wasn't getting paid enough. Not the, the hourly, it was just not enough hours. You right. Know. Um, there was nothing to do on weekends, even though they shot on weekends, but not, you know, I wouldn't be part of it. So I got a job at Publix. Okay. And, uh, I bagged groceries, stock shelves. So I did a lot of that for a while. And then, you know, after I graduated from high school, I was like, okay, I need to do something and more hours. And, uh, my dad says, well, you know, you ready to come down here and work full time? And I went, sure, let's do it. So we did that. And, um, like I said, at that time, it was a lot of Sears. I uh, did some stuff for NASA. Okay, that's and cool. And then started to learn um, you know, to you know, be a camera assistant. Mm-hmm. So. And what kind of, what were you working on, like, camera-wise back then? What kind of cameras? Yeah, like what kind of cameras? Uh, Airflex, okay. 16, SRs, BLs. And they uh, weighed about what, about 80 pounds? That was probably weighed about 40, you know, 30, Jesus. 40. Um, you know, you get the big, you know heads on them and wooden sticks my dad liked wooden sticks Mm -hmm. he didn't like the graphite or the metal sticks because if you bent them or crushed them then you're done right he could whittle his own uh leg back if he needed to yes yeah if he had a broken wooden one you know we had one you just go back in the back shop and cut one up and replace it right so he didn't like those but the wood ones were pretty heavy and then the big you know miller heads and o'connor heads Mm -hmm. she's they're probably 70 pounds themselves i I mean comparing the equipment of the day to like what we have now it's oh, yeah it's no, crazy no comparison i mean we have everything from uh, our entire office was just for editing film and then now it's you know we've got like 10 people in an office so right it's right. crazy it is it's remarkable what we could do today versus then you know we used to the i mean we had a whole you know screening room and we had machines that did you know three tracks Right, and then we'd make it into six tracks, and the twelve tracks, and eighteen tracks, and on and on and on. But we had to come back here and mix them, and then when you mix it, if you messed up, you had to stop, go back, rewind all the machines, bulk erase the tape that you were recording to, mm. start all over. Right, and now we can just go boop one button, all uh, that's done. Yeah, yeah, in a millisecond. When did you see the shift from you know that old school style of filmmaking to what you know kind of what we're used to now in the last decade or so? We did a lot of film, and then every once in a while, you know, if they wanted to get a commercial on the air quicker, they would go to one-inch tape, and that was probably in the mid-80s to late-80s. Um, a Cook a Good, I think, was one of the ones that wanted to start venturing to one-inch so mm-hmm. we could get it on the air quicker. Um, and then once it went to digital, that was, um, you know, I can't remember the year, but um, that was interesting and you know how that worked. I'm sure there was guys that fought it for a long time, and then yeah, we'd always say plastic is just plastic, and film is film. Mm-hmm. You know, plastic is the cheap stuff, and film is when you're really serious about doing. When you want to make something, yeah, yeah, really make some nice art, right? Know, we, we still believe it today, but <laughs> <laughs> you haven't changed your opinion on the matter. No, I mean, I still like you know, arc lights are beautiful light, but they're expensive, right? You got to have a guy on it the whole time and feed it with the rods and still a beautiful light tungsten is still a beautiful light you know you could look at a tungsten light and it's just beautiful and led you know okay sometimes they're a little on the pink magenta you know, right. green and you're just like Ugh. you know but uh, the led lights are getting better and better and you know i use them i have a lot of them myself right. and use them a lot of course right okay. i mean i'm sure it's but, just a cost benefit analysis it's like okay what well, is this gonna is it worth the the trouble of getting out the big ass tungsten light and bringing that out here and setting it up and Sometimes it is, and right, yeah, but you know, because how much you're paying you, right? Right. Well, it's just the it's just the look. I mean, the look, you know, just just love the tungsten look. You know, my brother is uh, in the industry still, and of course he's out in L.A. And uh, he was just doing a film the other day, and they had uh, the old arcs, and then he had a new uh, LED light that Aerie has. So it was a new LED light, right? Sort of like a, I think it's sort of between a a Fresnel 2K and 5K mixture, you know, in between that range, like a 3K. And uh, it's a nice light, but he had the picture of the three arc lights in the background and the new airy light. I think it's called a Orbiter. And it's a new one. It's just coming out right now. And he had a picture of that in the front of the arc lights. And we were just like, wow, a feature film with the new technology and 50-year-old technology right, working mix. on the same set. Yeah, that's uh, that's incredible. Yeah. Um. Okay, so being, you know, 
I came in here zero film uh, making experience, mm-hmm. uh, purely business, and seeing you know all of the old um, you know grip and gaffer stuff that you guys had back in there. It look you know it seems like the Patterson way was to do it, kind of make it yourself or DIY it. If you didn't have it, you can, you make it right. Well, since Dad was here in Florida, mm-hmm. uh, you know if, if if you're in LA, you can get a grip stand, grip light, whatever you want. Right. You had a blink of an eye. You know, being here in Florida. Back in the 60s, uh, you know, swamps and orange groves. and right. There was no Amazon Prime. There was no yeah. Amazon Prime, of course. Yeah. But it took you, even if you want to order it, by the time you make a phone call, they send you a brochure, which one do you like. Right. You know, you get back with them, make another phone call, then pricing. It takes right. you almost a month just to buy. And if you bought the wrong one or if right. it didn't work, you're Jesus. You're right. just, you know, you're two months out. So, so Dad's, yeah, you know, a lot of the salesmen were out of New York and L.A. And then you, know, you buy it and... You know, just use it and have fun. But and like I was talking earlier, it's like even just do a film, you mm-hmm. know, to score a film, to uh, just you know edit. You know, you had to go up to New York or you had to fly out to L.A. and edit films. So right. it was like a lot of wasted time flying. You had to change something. You had to go back to New York or L.A. So that's when he said, I'm going to add a recording room here at the studio with uh, you know, audio gear. And right. editing and start doing my own stuff. And this is that room now, right? Yep, this is the room that we did the screening in. That's so awesome. So we did a lot of mixing and you know, doing all the films from the old days. Nice, nice. So yeah, you guys do a bunch of, you did a bunch of, uh, you know, DIY stuff. What was the, right. like a time where you you said, oh man, I can't believe that actually worked. You know what I mean? I'm sure you guys have had a lot of situations where there's no safety regulations back then. No, there was no safety regulations then. We just did it, like climbed a ladder or climbed a scaffolding right. and just got up there and put a reflector up there. Dad would say, you know, put a reflector up there. He's okay, boom, gone. Right. You get a rope, pull it up, you know, shine it through the second story window or, you know, we did a lot of orange juice commercials, with, you know, Florida Citrus, and we needed to, you know, put reflectors or 10Ks up high, you know, just get the rope out and put a scaffolding next to the scaffolding we're putting the light on and haul it up there. And that's it. Mm-hmm. And nobody came on to them and say, hey, uh, maybe you should wear a safety harness or, you know, any. No, not in those days. I mean, I saw the pictures that you brought in. You know, there's a there's a guy on a van, and it looks like it's about 30 feet in the air on some scaffolding. Yeah. My dad would do that a lot. There's also another picture of my dad on a boat, and I think he's on six p- pairs of scaffolding. So each one's seven foot, so that's 42 on top of a pontoon boat, which is probably three or four feet. So, you know, you're at 50 feet, and then he's six foot tall. So right. he's, a, you know, so he's approximately 60 feet in the air. Jesus. And he's up there with a camera and a tripod. Right. There's no safety harness. There's He doesn't even have a... There's no railing. It's just an he, open yeah, platform. Yes, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a platform. And he has no, not even a life jacket if he fell. Right. You know, you know it's just like, that's got to get the shot. So, I mean, I'm sure with... You know the uh, the lax safety regulations. Like, there's been some accidents that you've seen on set, right? Like, there's not too many. I really? really, I really haven't seen a lot of accidents uh, on the sets that I've been on. I've heard. Yeah, you know, I figure some. somebody touched the wire they weren't supposed to, blow um, their fingers off. No, we had a. I, I was on a commercial one time, and uh, we put a water by the water, and of course, when the water would come up, the the wheel or the stand leg would you know go deeper and deeper in the sand, as you know when you're in a right. lake or the ocean. Yeah, it'll start sinking, and then remember the light falling in. Hey. And then we yelled at the guy to, you know, we yelled at him to say, you know, get away. Right. He thought we were yelling at him to save the light. Oh, no. So the light fell in, and, you know, the light was exposed and on as it fell in, and we are like, you know, get away, and everybody's just pulling cables right. to kill it, so we weren't going to, you know, kill the guy. And everything worked out. You know, he didn't get hurt, but he fell on the light. The light was heavy. And then by the time you grab it, the light pulled him in. Right. And he so fell he, right on top geez. of the light as he's holding it. And we're just like, Oh my God, this guy's dead. Yeah. But, like absolute uh, worst case scenario for yeah, what he could have done. But I guess everybody was pulling cables at the right time. And he just, you know, got up and said, Hey, I need a towel. <laughs> and we're like, thank God. Just a little bit embarrassed. That's it. And then, you know, there's a couple other, you know, other jobs. Nobody got hurt. You know, one time I had, we did a uh, Dick Clark special, I think it was Miss Teen USA or something, and I had like you know, two feet wide of two watt to run all the big lights and everything, right. and the whole set and everything. And uh, the guy happened to step right on the cables, and they didn't have a cable trough or anything. It was just a bunch of cables laying on the ground. And he stepped on it, and of course we're 
I just happened to see him do it. And then he just had this, like, he got electrocuted. He was just, like, standing on it and shaking and uh -huh. fell to the ground. And I'm just like, you know, kill the power, kill the power, you know, whatever. Something happened. And I thought the guy was fried. And uh happened the guy just had a seizure. <laughs> At the same exact At time the exact that he... Son, exact That's... time he was walking on the cable. But, you know, my heart, you know, went down to my toes. I thought I just killed somebody, you know, one of the crew guys. And couldn't figure out why. Cause right. Because I'm pretty meticulous on cable runs and i over a lot of the guys will complain to me i over cable my jobs right but, you know i'm sure that's the only time you've ever said like oh thank god he just had a stroke oh yeah i was just like you know as soon as the paramedic told me he had a seizure i said oh get him out of the way let's go right <laughs> he's fine he'll be good <laughs> yeah he's fine let's, we can we replace him let's not my fault okay fine. great right 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 but uh oh. no, he's a good guy now of course oh, of course but, uh, he came back the next day like nothing was going on and we were just like okay yeah i think that was a rehearsal but i remember standing we were sitting next to the director, and he was on one side of me, and Dick Clark was on the other side. And we were just like, you know, our mouse's jaws hit the table when we saw this guy get electrocuted, and we were just like, oh my god! And of course, everybody wants to help. Right, but you're not supposed to touch him. You're not supposed to touch yeah. him because then all of a sudden now you're getting electrocuted. Right, right. But uh, yeah, we we're very thankful he had a seizure. But I really didn't. Um, I didn't see many. You know. I mean, that's it's great. A, that's, it's, I, yeah, knock on wood. That, yeah, right. I didn't really see that much. You would just it's think hard, with all that, you know. Either I'm just lucky and, or I just can't remember. But You've, you've uh, bl you know, blocked out the tragedy from your head. So Yeah. I mean, I have some friends that, you know, got hurt with uh, camera cars, insert cars with cranes. Sure. Cranes falling over. Yeah. It just has it you know, haven't happened with a set that I've been on. Uh, that's the way she goes, though, right? So yeah, there's just, a, always a danger. Right. Always a danger. Um. You ever work with anybody like, uh, I know, like crazy? I'm sure, you know, we've been here a couple years. We get a lot of people that just, you know, drop in. They see a studio. There's, you know, eccentric weirdos that just drop by and have, you know, projects that they want to do. Do you ever, you know, did, was there anybody that dropped in that stands out or that you've worked with that's kind of uh, was like crazy and you're like, oh, this is kind of BS, but it ended up being like, oh, this is legit and was a, a good set or a good, a fun shoot? Um can't think of any. Um, you were telling me, what was the story you were telling me about? Uh, was it the XFL or somebody that you worked with that was, uh, they were flying you guys around, uh, some some millionaire was flying you guys around for some shoots of some football? Oh, yeah. What was that? That was, uh, that was when um, uh, the, the reality show started first happening. Uh-huh. So and, like early 90s? Yeah, I guess, yeah. yeah. And um, I can't, I think Survivor. TV show was just starting, but I think that's when reality TV started happening. Was right for Survivor, uh -huh. and um, this guy wanted to do a making of a football team, and it was arena football, and uh, this guy wanted to basically do a reality TV show of you know making a football team. Right, and it's uh, uh, the Hard Knocks, right? Like right, basically. So we would go uh, travel to different cities, uh, all in the Southeast United States. And, uh, you know, have practice and tryouts. And people would try out for the NFL, didn't make it for one reason or another, you know, weren't at, at the standard or, you know, broke a leg like two weeks before the tryouts. Right, or, right. Or, you know, funeral or something like D happened. D-League for basketball. Just, it's just like talented guys, but they're not at the uh, the NFL level. Correct. Or just, you know, bad luck or whatever. But right. But still would go out. And then uh, we would go to different cities. We flew out to um, Dallas. And then we went to Houston, the New Orleans, Atlanta, Tampa, Miami. Right. And uh, he was a the guy who was doing. It. We didn't understand what was going. I mean, we understood that it was a job, of course. And then all of a sudden, he was just like, you know, the guy was like, "We'll fly you out to Dallas with the camera gear and the cameraman." Right. And we would have a. We're trying to figure out how to do this because we're going city to city to city doing these tryouts. And it was like what you and a couple, just like a, a small skeleton crew of guys. Yeah, it was me and one of my friends, or two of my friends, and then they had a whole camera crew. I was just doing lighting, and lighting and grip and making it happen, sort okay. of like. And then he had, I think we had three cameramen, three audio guys, um, and then a couple PAs, and then there was a friend of mine, and me, and then uh, another guy. We were just trying to figure out, like, we were going to get in a bus, go to these cities, mm -hmm. work at day, jump on the bus, sleep at night while we're driving. Yeah, right, because the season's going on, and you're trying to capture, like, all the different moments of the pregame, postgame, like, all the in-between. Right. So, 
And then all of a sudden they finally figured out, okay, we're going to fly, you know, we're going to fly you uh-huh. in, from location to location instead of busing. Nice. I don't, I don't know why, uh, but, you know, we're, that's fine with me. So they said, well, we got to get equipment from city to city. Mm-hmm. And we're like, okay, well, when we stay at the hotel, we'll have a driver drive. So I got one of my other friends to drive a equipment truck, and we just threw all the equipment in the back of a, you know, budget you know, truck. Right. And go from city to city. And as we were flying, he was driving. And by the time we'd wake up the next morning, there's the truck sitting in the parking lot. He would go to bed. Okay. While we'd shoot. And, uh, when so, rinse, wash, repeat on that one. Right. That, I, man, I feel like he got the, uh, the shit end of the stick, uh, for the, you know, having to do all the driving and that uh, you guys are living the high life on the plane drinking champagne. Right. So uh, he's the one who got paid. So, <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> there's more to the story. There's more to the story, more than I should say, probably. Oh, you're fine. No one's watching this. But, uh, yeah, we go and the, the guy. Yeah, we we go on the um, the producer, and that's all I knew at the time was the producer. I didn't know the the, the executive producer, or the money funding right. guy. And we went to Dallas, and of course we have a thermometer on the field, and it's like a hundred and you know, twenty degrees on the field, and we're like setting it up, like they have the cameraman would go out there and shoot the tryouts, and the people you know mm-hmm. running the fifty yard dash and you know catching balls and right. all that, and then we would go to the end zone with all these people in the background. And we had the host and a host, a uh, host and a female host and a male host, and uh, so she sh- shows up, you know, attractive girl. And she simply knew her stuff. And, right. Okay. Cool. Here's one of the hosts. Okay. Who's who's the guy host? Oh, he'll be here in a minute. He's late. Okay. And we're like, you know, first job, first day, and you're late. Right. Yeah. This guy's fired for wow. sure. Wow. You know. Yeah. You're fired. You know. You're out of here. And all of a sudden, here comes the guy, and I'm like, oh, so really? Is that their host? And no, that's the host and the money money guy. Oh, okay. And we're like, oh yeah, he looks pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> we can wait on him. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah, take your time. All good. <laughs> but I remember we did that job, and uh, uh, Todd, who was my friend that was working with us, me, and uh, we'd have to set up like, okay, we want the players here. We want it backlit. Right. You know, this is how we want it set up. So, you know, Todd and I are like producing it and directing it. And we're supposed to be just a, you know, gripping gaffer. Right. You know? and- but we turned out to be like producers and all that. So, but we went from city to city and, you know, pretty good job at the the show. Never did air. Guy ran out of money. So, yeah. How'd you guys find out like he was out of money? Did you just like one day show up and the check bounce <laughs> and everything like just kind of fell that, to- that was, the, you know, we can talk about that. That was the only job I ever got, like didn't get paid for. It really, and so you've been, yeah. I mean, you've been doing it, what, 40 plus years? Yeah. And that's and, the only job you've ever, yeah. that's, and that's the same a good thing, record. And the same thing with my father that I know of. Um, I think there was only one job that, you know, he got, you know, didn't get paid on. Well, tell everybody now who that was and give them their, uh, their. Uh, I won't do that because the product, the product is still out there today, so. Oh, really? Yeah. So oh, wow. I'm sure that the company paid the ad agency or, you know, I don't know if my dad was the cameraman on it or if he was the production company on it, I don't know, but. I think he was the production company, but I think maybe the ad agency didn't pay him. Gotcha. So, but the project is still out there today. All right. Well, we'll, we'll, uh, mum's the word on that one. We yeah. won't, we won't talk too much. But, uh, yeah. So, uh, all the years that I've done it, there's only one job that I didn't get paid, and that was that one. And we went from city to city. We would fly at night, get to the hotel, wake up the next morning, go in the field at six o'clock, get the sunrise, you know, shoot the tryouts, do it all over again, you know. Right. Todd and I were like the last ones because you know, all the cameramen would wrap take the camera, put it on the truck, jump in the bus to go to the airport. Todd and I would have to wrap all the camera gear. Oh, geez. You know, batteries, lights, you know, all the stands, sandbags. Everybody else is in the bus. And, of course, the client would buy drinks, and they're up there drinking on the bus. And we're, okay, where's the, you know, where's the locker room? Because we got to take a shower because right. we're sweating. And I'm not going to get on a bus that, you know, a smell. It wasn't like a tour bus like it is now. It wasn't a uh, full shower scenario no, where you could go no, on there no, and, you no, know. It was a. A nice bus, you know, 55 passenger bus, but yeah, we didn't. You know, we got on, hey, you guys are gonna have to wait on us. And they said, well, we got time, we gotta jump on a plane. You know, cool. Sometimes we'd have a private jet, you know, like a 727 just for us. That's awesome. And it was a, I mean, it seemed like it was a, a good thing going. We had coaches from the Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, from the Tampa Bay, um, Tampa Bay uh, Storm. Yeah, it was I the Tampa Storm and Orlando Predator, Predators? Predators. Predators, yes. Predators. I remember listening to uh, 1041, the radio station, back in the day, and they were always doing promos with uh, the owner Brett Bushy from uh, from the Predators, and he was a crazy guy. It seems like the uh, the arena football was like all the guys that owned the teams were kind of 
like borderline super rich. So they were crazy and they would always have some kind of schemes going and right. lots of, you know, back and forth with the ownership. But, uh, I mean, at least you had fun though, right? Like, yeah, we had fun. We went from city to city. There's some stories there. Of course, we would get on the bus and drink and, you know, have fun with the coaches and the other crew members. Right. And went to city to city. And then we went to Atlanta and then, uh, that was like a week long shoot so far, and we were flying from Atlanta to Tampa, and we got checks when we we're in the airplane. You know, here comes the producer walking down the aisle. You know, we're in a private jet. Right. We're staying at Hiltons and Hyatts. We're staying in suites. Um, you know, we're with the elite people. You know, coaches like I said from you know, Pittsburgh Steelers to I think one was from Atlanta, one was from Dallas Cowboys, and then of course you had the like the Storm and the Predators and other coaches that were like defensive coaches. Uh huh. Or quarterback coaches, and it's legit. And so we're just getting checks, and we're like, okay, great, we got a check. Okay, go into the next city. And then, of course, we were like, next city. We didn't have time to go to the bank. Oh, so you never, so when you went to deposit all of the checks? Yeah, we were like, probably like second week into the shoot. Oh, no. By the time we'd get home. Right. And, you know, the other guys were like, get home, you know, give it to their wives or whatever. Right, right. We didn't have time to go to the bank, you know, so because we landed, we landed to Tampa and then Tampa to Miami. So we, got in a truck and drove from Tampa to Miami to do the Miami shoot and then driving back from Miami, come back to Lakeland because Lakeland was going to be the, uh, like the home you know, get together and, you know, pick all the players. I got you. Like the, where they did the draft, right? Right. Yeah. Cause they were going to use the, uh, the civic center there in, in Lakeland. I'm sure. Uh, it was going to use Tiger town. Really? Tiger yeah, town. Tiger town. Okay. I think there's some apartment complexes there that the baseball players stay at. And this okay. is where they were going to do this. Right. At. And then, you know, all of a sudden one of the guys called me up and he said, hey, did you deposit your check yet? And I went, no, I haven't had time. And he goes, well, I did and mine bounced. And we're like, uh-oh. <laughs> so we're like, okay, well, let me call up the, you know, the producer. And right. I'm sure it's like something happened like an a account. banking error, yeah, yeah. Yeah, banking error or wrong account or, you know, just didn't put the funds in yet because, you know, he's been with us too. Right. And then uh, so all of a sudden we said, well, Let's call the bank up. So we called the bank up and said, hey, this account, does it have funds in it? And all of a sudden they said no. And right. then I called my guy who was driving the truck uh -huh. at night. Oh, he hasn't gotten the word yet. He's still driving, right? He, well, he was driving, but he drove from Atlanta to Florida. Well, he deposited his check when he was in Atlanta. Okay. So, because there's a bank branch up there. So okay. he deposited and then he drove to Tampa. And that's when we got our checks. And then, uh, like I said, it was like two or three days later, his check went through. I called him up. I said, hey, do you have any problems with your check? And he goes, no. I said, you sure? Yeah, I see it right here. It's deposited. I went, okay. Anyway, so, yeah, we got to the end and, you know, shut the door on the and cameras. And we said, no check, no cameras. Hey, that's the way it works. And well, that's a great spot for us to leave it. We're going to definitely have you back because uh, there's tons of history to still go through uh, for the next time. But we'll uh, we'll get to it then. But I want to thank you for being the first guest on the uh the podcast and uh sure. is there anything you need to plug you got a, a company anything you want to throw out there for people to follow no okay I'm just, great <laughs> i'm just i just do my own thing i just do a lot of lighting and you know, have my own lights and stuff and do a lot of commercials and stuff like that so well cool all right until next time we will see you later